morning, and welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study of the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, located at 3547 East 142nd Street in Cleveland, Ohio. I am Pastor Lydia Spragan. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we thank you this morning for allowing us to come together to study your word. Send now your Holy Spirit that he might teach each of us what he would have us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. On last Saturday, I taught the story of the flood in Genesis chapter 6. And I did that using what we have known as a chiasm, or come to know as a chiasm. Uh, in reading some of the comments, I discovered that perhaps it was a little bit hard to follow. So I have added a reference link so that you can click on it and see the chiasm and hopefully go over it again in your mind. The point of the flood story that is included in the narrative is not that there was a flood, not even that God had judgment, but that God remembered Noah. Now today, I want to move on, and I want us to discuss one other uh, point regarding Genesis 1 through 11. Throughout the Bible, we, we discover covenants. In fact, Covenant is a big word. It says uh, we serve a covenant God or we are in a covenant relationship. And most of the time if you ask somebody what is a covenant, they don't have a clue. Uh, I know I didn't have a clue for the longest time. So I want to try to uh, put it in terms this morning that we all understand and that we can follow. And then uh, we're going to go through the Bible and look at some covenants. And if I don't have time this week, we're going to again come back and hit covenants again next week and look at the covenants that are primarily in chapters 1 through 11. Now, in its simplest terms, a covenant, and the word I'm using, covenant, C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T, C-O-V as in Victor, E-N-A-N-T. A covenant is a contract, an agreement between two or more parties. Now, uh, marriage is the most familiar example in our culture, but almost anything that requires two signatures can be considered a kind of covenant from buying a car to getting approved for a mortgage to signing up for a home security system. Whenever we have legally binding agreements, legally binding agreements, we have covenants. So if we want to take a few notes right now, we want to write down covenant is a contract. Now we're going to we're going to go a little further. But that's in its simplest terms. Now covenants in the Bible, however, about more than contracts. They are about people. They are about people. In the Bible, we don't want to simply think of it as a contract. We want to think of a covenant as a commitment. Covenant commitment that establishes a relationship between two or more persons. A covenant is a commitment that establishes a relationship between two or more persons. For our purposes, we are looking at those covenants that establish a relationship between God and his people. God and his people. A covenant bond that establishes stipulations, makes promises, guarantees blessings, and threatens curses. Now I'm going to come back to that. 
Because whenever we're looking at a covenant, we're going to be looking at certain characteristics. It's going to establish a stipulation. Or it may make a promise. It's going to guarantee blessings and threaten curses. In fact, the basic elements of biblical covenant covenants are historical prologue, commands, prohibitions, blessings, and curses. Prologue, P-R-O-L-O-G-U-E. A historical prologue, a command, a prohibition, P-R-O-H-I-B-I-T-I-O-N-S. Prohibitions, blessings, and curses. So, when we're looking at a covenant bond, we're going to generally look for those basic elements. It's going to establish some stipulations, make some promises, guarantee some blessings, and threaten curses. Now, just as we must sign on the dotted line in our legally binding documents, any contract that we sign, we put, must put our signature. So too did ancient covenants require some kind of oath ratification. So we're going to look for some kind of oath ratification. Normally, this involved blood as a sign and seal of the obligations established, the blessings promised upon obedience, and the curses threatened upon disobedience. So let me say this again because I want to lay a good foundation for us and I want to make sure everybody is with me. Covenants in the Bible are about more than contracts. They are about people. A covenant is a commitment that establishes a relationship between two or more persons. For our purposes, we are looking at those covenants that establish a relationship between God and his people. Okay? A covenant bond that establishes stipulations, makes promises, guarantees blessings, and threatens curses. Uh, just as we must sign on the dotted line in our legally binding documents, so too did ancient covenants require some kind of oath ratification. Normally, this involved blood as a sign and seal of the obligations established, the blessings promised upon obedience, and the curses threatened upon disobedience. The basic elements of biblical covenants are, number one, historical prologue, number two, commands, number three, prohibitions, blessings, and curses. Now, I'm going to uh, an article that I found that is by Thomas R. Schreiner, S-C-H-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E and in it, he tells us why we must understand the covenants to understand the Bible. It is very well written, and I'm going to follow it along with uh, some comments, as I usually do. The comments are crucial because they are the backbone of the storyline of the Bible. The Bible isn't a random collection of laws, moral principles, and stories. It's a story that goes somewhere. It's the story of redemption, the story of God's kingdom, and the story unfolds and advances through the covenant God makes with his people. So one of the reasons that we want to study the covenants is because if we understand the covenants, we can then see the storyline of the Bible. If we don't understand the covenants, 
we will not and cannot understand the Bible. Now, all of this is in where we get to when we start saying, if we understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, then we have the foundation to understand the rest of the Bible. Because one of the ways that we can study the Bible is by studying the covenants in the Bible and looking at how they relate one to another. We will understand how the story fits together. Um, we're going to do this by quickly surveying the covenants in the scriptures. Now, some of these covenants go by different names, but today, for our purposes, we're going to use uh, simple names, and then next week, we're going to go back and try to lay it out a little better. The first covenant that we want to write down is the creation covenant. The creation covenant. God created the world and the human beings, showing that he's the sovereign ruler of all. He created Adam and Eve as priests and kings, as those made in his image to rule the world for God. They were to extend God's rule over the entire earth. As God's son and daughter, they would be confirmed in life and righteousness if they obeyed the Lord. If they obeyed the Lord. But they would be cursed if they transgressed the command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, we see there was a covenant blessing and a covenant cursing. They ate from the forbidden tree and experienced the covenant curse. By God's grace, the story doesn't end there. For the Lord promised to triumph over the serpent through the offspring of the woman. Remember, that's our favorite, our favorite verse in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. verse 15. So the creation story begins where God promises that he has created. Uh, the, the rule originally given to Adam and Eve would be restored through the offspring of the woman. So God is promising in Genesis chapter 3 that the rule originally given to Adam and Eve would be restored through about is the covenant with Noah. The covenant with Noah. Okay, so the creation basically is chapters 1, 2, and then 3. And then you get to 6 through 9 in Genesis, and you've got the covenant with Noah. Now, as history unfolds, the horrific... Only eight righteous people left in the world and the promise of redemption through the offspring of the woman seemed like a distant memory. The entire world except for Noah and his offspring were wiped out in the flood. Remember, God always is going to leave a remnant and Noah and his family, Noah and Mrs. Noah, whose name we discovered was Namah, and their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives were the only eight people that God spared 
The rest of the world, the entire world, was wiped out in the flood. God made a covenant with Noah, promising that the human race wouldn't be annihilated or wiped out again until the plan of redemption through the offspring of the woman was fulfilled. Now, there are a couple of things we should be, uh, even though we're studying covenants, we should be looking at the love of God and how God is keeping his promises and how God is being faithful to his word. Noah was in some ways a new Adam on a new earth. And thus the creation covenant with Adam was rejuvenated. Still, salvation would not come through Noah because like Adam, he sinned. Like Adam sinned in the garden. The fundamental and the fundamental evil in the heart of human beings persisted. Now we know that everybody obviously failed. Noah even though he was a righteous man, the first thing he did when he got off the ark was get drunk, overindulge. So he wasn't the one either. The next covenant, the third covenant, is the covenant with Abraham. Abraham. Now, we haven't really studied Abraham, but we do know that Genesis 1 through 11 lays the foundation. And Genesis is a funnel. So it starts out like this and it narrows down to just one family. The family of Abraham and his descendants. And that's what chapter 12 through chapter 50 is all about. So after Noah the world again slid into sin with the Tower of Babel, or Babel, B-A-B-E-L, as the signature of sin. In this dire situation, God called one man, Abraham, and made a covenant with him. The Lord promised Abraham land, Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N. He promised him offspring. Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, and a blessing would extend to the ends of the earth. Okay, so we've got Abraham was like a new Adam, and Canaan was to be a new Eden where God dwelt with his people. As the children of Abraham trust in the Lord and obey him, the promises would be fulfilled. At the same time, the Lord promised a dramatic covenant ceremony that the promise would certainly be fulfilled. Now, if we want to read about the dramatic cer uh, ceremony, we would read Genesis 15. Genesis 15. So at a later time, look for Genesis 15. God pledged that he would keep his promise, but he would do it through the obedient offspring of Abraham. Thank you, Sister Carletta, for keeping up with us and taking a few notes so that we can see uh, what we're actually saying here. So Genesis 15. So now we have the covenant the creation covenant, number one. The covenant with Noah, number two. And then we have the covenant with Abraham. And the story is moving along. But the next covenant that we have is the covenant with Israel. Now, I'm just going to digress for just a second so that we're all on the same page. Who is Israel? Okay. Okay. Abraham had a son. Actually, he had two sons that are uh, basically in the Bible. 
but the one son was the child of the promise. His name was Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, yes, Esau and Jacob. Jacob had an encounter with God where his name was changed to Israel. Israel. So we've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now these people are also known in the Bible as patriarchs. P-A-T-R-I-A-R-C-H. Patriarchs. Okay, so we have the covenant with Israel. Now, Israel had 12 sons. 12 sons. And so, there, thus we get the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? So, a covenant was also made with Israel after they were freed from Egypt by God's grace. So we see now that Israel is not only the name of a person, but Israel becomes the name of a nation of people who are in covenant relationship with God. Okay? And we know that all of them did not obey all the time. Okay? Okay? So if we're going to go through that a little further, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. We have 10 tribes and 2 tribes. The tribe of Benjamin and Judah, they are more faithful than the tribes, the other 10 tribes. The other 10 tribes are just wicked. They're led by wicked kings and, and whatnot. So a covenant was also made with Israel after they were freed from Egypt by God's grace. Israel was God's son and Abraham's offspring and the means by which blessing would flow to the whole world. They were priest kings mediating God's blessing and rule in the world. They lived in Canaan, which was to be like a new Eden, a place where God ruled and dwelt in the midst of a holy people. The stipulations of the covenant with Israel are summarized in the Ten Commandments. And the Lord promised blessing if they obeyed, but if they violated God's prescriptions, they would suffer the consequences. Indeed, they would even be ejected from the land and go into exile. So, what you will find is eventually the king, the, the tribes of Israel are captured. And they go into exile. Why? Because they won't obey God. But what do we see? God is still being faithful. God is still being faithful. The next covenant is the covenant with David. The covenant with David. The promise of victory over the serpent and his offspring will come through a child of Abraham. And we know that from Genesis 3.15 and from Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse and Genesis, the 12th chapter, the first through the third verse. But in God's covenant with David, a new feature of the promise appeared. Though if one reads the story carefully, there were indications of this promise all along. And that's 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7. The new feature is that victory over the serpent would come through a king, the child of Abraham, who will conquer sin and death 
will be a son of David. The promise of land and universal blessing will be secured through David's dynasty. Now, the king then was a new kind of Adam in a new land. And for a brief time, it almost looked as if all the promises would come to pass during Solomon's reign. Why? Because there was peace. Solomon was wise. They didn't fight. It was a whole reign of peace. The covenant with David, however, had conditional and unconditional elements as well. If the kings transgressed, then they would face God's judgment. And we know, we know that David transgressed. David messed up. David sinned with Bathsheba. And this is probably a good time for me to go back for just a second because um, Abraham was a liar. Israel also was a liar. David slept with another man's wife. So every time God makes a covenant with somebody, they mess up. They mess up. So we get to the covenant with David. And David transgressed. He slept with Bathsheba and therefore faced God's judgment. As history progresses, now we're moving through the timeline of the Bible, moving through the timeline of the Bible, and we're studying it by covenants. It becomes evident that something was radically wrong with the kings and with the nation. In fact, the sins of the king of Judah and Israel were so significant that Israel was expelled from the land. God had pledged that the world would be transformed through a son of David, but the promise was going backwards. Israel and Judah were thrown out of the land in 722 and 586 B.C. respectively. So, if you say, well, uh, Judah is actually the two tribes Judah and Benjamin together so when we're talking about Judah we're talking about those two tribes and Israel is the other ten tribes one is known as the northern kingdom and the other is known as the southern kingdom in the Bible the northern kingdom is made up of ten tribes and the southern kingdom is made up of two tribes. And they become known as Judah and Israel. Okay? So when you start to read about Judah and Israel in the Bible, you're reading about the two, the, the 12 tribes of Israel who are the sons of Israel. And 10 of them kind of became wicked and the other two they were closer to God and they had some good kings but they also disobeyed and the result of their disobedience was that they were expelled out of the land and they were taken captive okay or placed in the exile what was happening to God's great promise then we get the new covenant. The new covenant. Israel had made a mess of things. And it almost seemed as if the promise of triumph over the serpent had been withdrawn. But we remember the promise in Genesis 3.15. We can always go back to Genesis 3.15. And what we know, we know that God is faithful. God is going to keep his word. And that promise was unconditional. And that the Lord also guaranteed 
that victory will come through a child of Abraham and a son of David. So God is keeping his word. Even though the Israelites, whether they be the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, uh, they not in total obedience to God. So, there's a problem. There's still a problem with covenant made with Israel. And the cancer resided in the people. They failed to keep God's commands and thus experienced the curses of the covenant. Anytime you disobey the commands of the covenant, you have curses. Anytime you obey the covenant, you have blessings. And we're going to look at something toward the end. They failed, the people of Israel failed to keep God's commands and experience the curses of the covenant. The Lord enacted a new covenant with his people, which fulfilled the promises made to Abraham, Adam, Abraham, and David. Now this one I want us to read. Turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah in the Bible. And go to the 31st chapter. And we'll get to the 31st chapter. Go down to the 31st verse. Jeremiah 31, 31. Listen. The days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. It will not be like the ones that we've already had. Not like the one I made with David. Not like the one I made with Israel. Not like the one I made with Abraham. Not like the one I made with Noah. Not like the creation covenant. It's going to be a new covenant I made it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel listen we got a new covenant and here it is this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says. Now, from verses 33, 31 through 34, we have written the new covenant. The new covenant finds its fulfillment in Jesus the Christ, who is the true son of Abraham, the true son of God, the true Israel, the true David, the son of man, and the servant of the Lord. The new covenant promise of forgiveness of sins is fulfilled in Jesus himself. And thus he pours out his spirit on the people so that they are enabled to do his will. And where, does, where do we find that? In Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. So if you go forward from Jeremiah, Lamentations, you're going to then get to Ezekiel. 
Turn to Ezekiel, the 36th chapter. And when we get to the 36th chapter, we're going to start reading at the 26th verse. The 26th verse. And listen at what God says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. Ezekiel 36 verses 26 through 27. So we see that God is keeping his promise and he's made the new covenant. This new covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's perfect. Okay? He's perfect. All those who belong to Jesus are his offspring. They are the children of Abraham and members of the Israel of God. The land promise is also fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The first glimmer of the promise is located in Jesus' resurrection, which guarantees the resurrection of believers and the new creation which is coming. In the new creation, the entire world is God's temple. And the whole universe is the new Jerusalem where God and the Lamb dwell. Now let's turn to that. And this is in Revelation. Now, I know some of us are scared to read Revelation, but listen, if you really have a relationship with Jesus the Christ, you really want to read Revelation. Why? And I'm going to digress for just a second, because what is Revelation? If you look at Revelation, the first chapter, and I'm going to come back to uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about in a minute. If you look at Revelation, the first chapter, it says the revelation from Jesus Christ. It's not just any old revelation. This is the revelation from Jesus the Christ. Some, some Bibles uh, translated the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we start off at the beginning of the Bible with in the beginning God. And God begins to reveal himself over time in a story. And the story gets to revelation. And it says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's a progressive story. It's a progressive outline. And it is progressing through covenants. And now we get to revelation. In the new creation. The entire world is God's temple. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw, hallelujah, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself, hallelujah, God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He 
who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he's telling John to write it down. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said unto me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. That's where that's talking about, 12 gates to the city? <laughs> a high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. Listen, this is how you know that you don't think like God. Gold to us is not like glass. But hallelujah, gold is like glass to God. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, a gate. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth ruby, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amaranth. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Ooh -wee. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, but the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the king of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will the gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. There will be, nor will anyone, 
who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Go on to chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Hallelujah. Eternal life. Hallelujah. Yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will serve him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. They will. There will no more. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. What a word. <laughs> what a blessing. The universal blessing. Blessing for all nations and people also comes to pass in Jesus. In the old covenant. God's people consisted almost exclusively of Israel, but the fullness of God's promise to Abraham has become a reality in every tribe, tongue, people, and nation are blessed in Jesus Christ as they trust him for eternal life. What? Now, what did we just do? We covered the Bible from Genesis to Revelation by covenants. God kept his promise. Even though we didn't keep our promise, God kept his promise. God kept his promise. God's promise was kept. That's all we need to know. God is faithful. That which he promises, he will do. That's why we sing the song, Hold on, keep the faith. Do not doubt. God keeps his promise. Now, we see what's in store for us if we are faithful and obedient to God. But if we aren't, just like we just read and we were all happy and we were shouting and whatnot, if we do not keep our part of the bargain, God will keep his part of the bargain. And there will be a place prepared for those of us who decide that we don't want to, to have no part of what God is telling us to do. And we run around being disobedient. God has a place for us. It is called hell. Now, you say, hell ain't real. All righty then. If everything else in the Bible is real, and God has kept his promise from Genesis to Revelation, hundreds of years, thousands of years. And he has kept his promise from there, from Genesis to Jesus dying on the cross, to the Revelation. And he's made the promise of the new Jerusalem. What makes you think that hell is not real? There is no reason for you to live in hell on earth. And live in hell for eternity. Let me invite you today. If you are not in relationship with Jesus the Christ. I'm going to invite you. Just try it. 
try Jesus. Give your life to him. Most of us can testify that when we didn't have Jesus in our lives, we made a mess of things. Even if it looked like everything was going well with us, we weren't fully satisfied. We was always looking for something more, more success, more money, more something. Well, Jesus is the more you need. In fact, he's the all you need. Try Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to the end of our study on the covenants. And we, Father God, would like to partake of the blessings, not of the curses. For the blessings are many that you have promised us in the covenant. Father God, look inside of us. Those places, Father God, where we are running amok and going astray, we ask, Lord, that you would grab us and put us back on the path that you have prepared for us. You see, we look at life from beginning to end. But you prepared us with the end already in mind. You know the end. You know the plan and the purpose that you have prepared us and made us for. And if we follow your will and follow your plan, follow your purpose, you tell us that they are for good and they will not harm us. They are made to prosper us. So Father God, help us to put ourselves in your hands. And in your hands, no man can pluck us out. Help us to rest in your hands. Not worry about things in your hands. Because we know that you've got it. Whatever it is, you've got it. That's why you are the great I am. I am whatever you need me to be. Whatever you need me to be. However you need me to be it. Whenever you need me to be it, I am. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before I close, I did intend to make reference to one place. And I do want to do that before I close out this topic. And it is in the book of Deuteronomy. The 28th chapter. And in it, it talks about the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. I want you to go back and read that on your own. Take your time and read through it and see what the blessings are for obedience. Take your time. And then when you get to the 20, I mean the 15th verse, you're going to read the word however. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees, I am giving you today all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Just like the blessings can come on you and overtake you, cursings can come on you and overtake you 
were disobedient. Read it. Meditate on it. None of us are perfect. We've all fallen short. God tells us to press toward the mark in the word. Press toward the mark. Sin is missing the mark. We want to press toward the mark. Lord, help me to be obedient where I'm not obedient. And then fill my life with blessings. Let them overflow. Open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing that I have not even room enough to, to receive. Blessings. Let me stop because that's a, that's a whole nother subject. In fact, I feel like preaching right now and that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be teaching. But the blessings of God are wonderful. And the curses of God are horrible. Horrible. May God bless you. May God keep you until we meet again. And remember that God really does love you and so do I. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday. I pray you got a word and I look forward to seeing you on next Saturday.